welcome back to Celtic State of Mind. We are in State of Mind Studios and I'm here with Colin Watt to talk about a moment in time, a moment in Celtic's history. Colin, I ask you on a weekly basis to come up with an image that we can then look at from Celtic's history and talk about the times around about that image. Tell us, what image have you chosen this week? So this image uh, sort of predates myself. It's something that we're looking back to, one of Celtic's greatest uh, title winning performances just ahead of the start of the season as we look towards going for 10 in a row we're going back to the 21st of May 1979 a day that will always go down in the Celtic folklore 10 men won the league so we're going for 10 in a row and there's a wee theme on the 10 there it's a game I know really well even though I had only been born the previous year it is a game I know well because Andy Lynch was involved in this game Andy played left back Mm -hmm. and I spoke to Andy at length. This was one of the highlights of his career. So just to give a bit of the background, uh, Jock Steen had left the manager's position in 1978 and he was replaced by his former captain, the one and only Billy Billy McNeil. Uh, I've asked the question quite a bit. Was there anyone else who could have replaced Jock Steen at that time? Well, that's an interesting question and obviously Scottish football still in that resurgent period We've still got teams getting towards the sort of latter stages of the European competitions. When you look back on that era, who are the managers within Scottish football that you'd have thought had that experience? Now, we, we look at some managers going forward towards the, the late 90s and even our current manager, Neil Lennon, who took over without a lot of coaching experience. Billy McNeil was the same. He was kind of coming in as a bit of a rookie coach. Was there coaches out there in Scottish football you thought were more qualified for the position? More qualified, probably not, but what I would say is Billy McNeil didn't want to go into management. He went to Clyde and one of the individuals who persuaded him to take that job up was Hubert. Hubert had been the photographer at Celtic for many, many years and he took the famous picture of the Lisbon Lions, the only colour image of the Lisbon Lions and the Big Cup and Jockstein, the only colour image. And you actually see that if you go into the reception area at Celtic Park, so on the right-hand side on the wall. Mm -hmm. So that was Huey Burt, uh, the late Hugh Burt took that image. So he was obviously really friendly with Jockstein, he was friendly with Billy McNeil, away from the club as well. And he got Billy into the coaching and into the idea uh, management. And it was only when he was approached by Clyde that Billy you know, changed his mind and got into management. He then moved to Aberdeen and when the manager's post came up at Celtic, the suggestion is, the paper talk around at that time was there were three in the running. One of them was Bertie Old, and the other was Paddy Crerand. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously at that time, if you think about the, the history of the club, we wouldn't have brought in someone from outside the inner sanctum of Celtic no. because it was a former player. Uh, often a former captain who then became the manager. And so Billy McNeil was the perfect choice, and I think he proved that when he came in. But I always thought, I always maintained that Bertie in that dugout as a manager would have been fantastic, Colin. Do you know, the the character of Bertie certainly would have brought something different to the, the manager's role. When you look at the respect that Mr Steen had, everyone called him Mr Steen. It wasn't Jock Steen, it was Mr Steen. And everyone wanted to perform for Mr Steen. Now, imagine someone like Betty Old in that position, with the sort of character that, even to this day, he's still up for a laugh and a joke. (laughs) Can you imagine someone like that in a managerial position, still actually coaching some of the players that he played with as well? So, I don't know if that would have worked. I think we probably did make the right choice in going with Billy. I think so. I mean, it's one of the things, though, Colin, if you've played for a club, there's always going to be the chance that you're going to manage your ex-teammates. And it's probably one of the most difficult parts is taken over. And uh, obviously Billy McNeil came in. At that time, what you're looking at as well is the the worst season in Jock Steen's managerial career previously, 1977-78. That followed the remarkable double, and I've already mentioned Andy Lynch. Andy Lynch scored the winner in the 1977 Scottish Cup final, 1-0 against Rangers. And again, Paddy Crellon, who I've already mentioned, was the commentator that day. He said it was definitely a penalty. I don't think he was asked back to do the commentary after that. <laughs> it was a dubious penalty, but you know, it was a penalty. So Andy Lynch was a, a big part of that that side. The following season, though, was a terrible season for Jock Steen. We, we finished fifth in the league, Colin. Mm-hmm. Now, if you look at the final league game, it was at Love Street. And St Mirren beat Celtic 3-1. Who was in charge of St Mirren? 
Alex Ferguson. It was almost like a passing on of this baton. Mm -hmm. When you look back to Sir Matt Busby and you look at Bill Shankly and you look at Jock Steen and then obviously it was a it was a succession of Scottish managers coming through. So it was almost a passing of the baton. And obviously we'd come back with great success oh, to, yep. to you know to Scotland, Scotland to manage yeah. Scotland. But yeah, Billy McNeil comes in and there was a rebuild required. And the reason for that is quite unusual because when you go back to seventy seven after the double, Celtic sold Kenny Dalgleish, mm -hmm. British record transfer, four hundred and forty thousand between two British clubs. So the money that was made from that wasn't what you would expect properly invested by the Celtic board because let's let's be honest, Jock Steen may have identified players at that time, but I think it was very difficult for him to tie them down. When you look at the signings he made, mm -hmm. we also lost various other players. We lost Pat Stanton due to injury and we lost Alfie Conn. So we were going into a season there and Danny McGrain obviously had a bad injury. Ankle injury, yep. So we were going into a season there in 77-78, which was the season before Billy came in and Celtic were in disarray. Billy comes in He's got a big, big job on his hands. So how did he then start rebuilding that club? So if you look at some of the players that he brought in um, that season, you're looking at guys like Jim Lumsden, guys like Davy Proven for £125,000, which is a lot of money back then. Record signing between two Scottish clubs? £125,000. I mean, for when you look at the, the mentality of the board back then, to spend that sort of money obviously shows that they had some sort of belief in McNeil that he could turn that around. Guys like Murdo McLeod, £100,000. There's a lot of kind of outlay going out there. Even guys with experience, like Bobby Lennox coming back to the club, Vic Davidson, it sort of showed that McNeil knew where the gaps were coming from. He needed the creativity going forward. He needed the experience to sort of grind out results. But for some reason, it just didn't start all too well for him. Seven wins in the first 18 mm. games. When you're looking back at that, you're thinking, if someone only had seven wins in the first 18 games nowadays... Twitter meltdown. Oh, aye. Colin, see, when you look at that, though, that is a hangover from the previous season. It really is. Bill McNeil comes in. I've, I've interviewed quite a lot of that team, actually. And what they, they tell me is that he very quickly realised that there was a group of players he wasn't going to use. And these are players that were very... Very good Celtic players, Ronnie Glavin, for example, Joe Craig, Paul Wilson, mm -hmm. who had been at the club for 12 years. Yep. So he ships them out for very small fees, and then he was able to bring in two what then were big buys in David Proven and Murdo McLeod. So you had the youth and, or the legs, and you had the experience, as you said, of Vic Davidson and Bobby Lennox and Jim Lumsden, who wasn't, although he was still a player, it wasn't thought that he would ever play. Mm -hmm. But we were so strapped for players in the early part of the season, he ended up playing for Celtic. And Lumsden obviously had a fantastic managerial career with, with Davy Moyes. Yep. He was Davy Moyes' go-to uh, as an assistant. But back then, he was the experience that Billy wanted back in at the club, along with, with the youth. And the youth started to come through and, and proven, and McLeod became two of the pivotal stars of the team that season. Now, See, when you look at David Proven and the way that Celtic fans view him now, and there's a few players, there's a few players. We mentioned a few actually recently because two of the guests on a Celtic state of mind in the last couple of months have been Gordon Marshall and Mark Wilson. And people even suggest, why would you interview them? Well, of course we would. Because, you know, Gordon Marshall was at the club for seven years. Mark Wilson was at the club for six years. So I want to know about their time at the club. Mm -hmm. There are other issues. Sometimes it's punditry that Celtic fans are unhappy with. In Gordon Marshall's case, it's him celebrating uh, when Kilmarnock were playing Celtic and Celtic failed to win the league that day. Yep. Uh, there were many other issues around the reasons why Celtic didn't win the league. But I think what uh, sticks in the throat of Celtic fans is the, the way in which Marshall was celebrating a 4 nothing defeat. So David Proven's now in that category. And I think... It's due to the fact that he airs views when on any channel that are certainly not pro-Celtic. What's your views on Davy now when you look back on the glorious career he had cut short, unfortunately, through illness? As you say, it's, it does come to a stage where people like myself who never got to experience Davy playing football are only able to judge the character of the person on what you see on television. Now, he's not the only person to fall into that category. You take a look at Charlie Nicholas. Charlie Nicholas, fantastic footballer, terrible person at making a joke. 
when he was on Sky Tumble Sports weed. oh yeah exactly when he was on Sky Sports News the other day with Jim White it was just an example of that and the thing is these people still have to make a living these people still need that job it's not as if they're, they were getting paid the millionaires wages that pl- players are getting paid now the likes of Davey Proven the likes of Charlie Nicholas they'll still need that job so if they have to sort of tone down their bias towards Celtic to get that role then you, you have to kind of understand that to an extent it's when players come out that were treated very well by the club that then have this sort of vendetta against them and there's a, a particular player that's no longer part of a commentary team which I think has failed because of that. It's that that really sticks in the Celtic fans' throats. Now if you look back at the, the generation, my dad's generation, my uncle's generation, they'll look back and they'll look at the, the players that played this day, like Johnny Doyle, like Josh McCluskey, like Tom McAdams, Danny McGrain, and you understand that there is, no matter what they've done, there's still a love for them because of what they've done when they put the Celtic jersey on. And I think deep down, if you strip it back and you forget some of the things that you've read in the papers... Because a, a newspaper article can be so easily twisted from what the original offer is put forward. You actually have to realise that these people do have the club's best intentions at heart. But at the end of the day, sometimes it's just newspapers wanting to sell a paper. I've mentioned before, I've interviewed Davey and I've interviewed Charlie. And both of them spoke very, very fondly about Celtic mm-hmm. when I interviewed them. But Charlie Nicholas actually is someone I want to speak about in relation to this game. He's too young, obviously, to have been involved in the game itself, but there is a Charlie Nicholas story attached to the game that we'll get to. But when you look at the, as you say, the bad start, we then had the terrible winter, which meant that there was loads of postponements, uh, which actually was the only reason that we played this game when we did, because it was normally, it was meant to be a January fixture, and obviously it was delayed right through until the May. So it's now known as 10 men win the league or the 4-2 game. And I've spoken to Andy at length about the game, you know, blow by blow. I've spoken to Danny about the goal that whistled in past him and against the post and and into the net. And he still regrets that because he could have stopped it, but he thought it was going wide Mm -hmm. because he had his hand on the post. So it was a night of drama. There was a lot of things kind of happening around that time as well because it was a television strike. Yep. which means that we can't watch it in glorious technicolour. Um, but also there was a there was a strike on with the rails yep. network and, and also buses. So people look at the attendance and they think, oh, it wasn't as big. I think the official attendance was 56, but the official attendances and the actual attendances were two different things <laughs> anyway, Colin. But certainly uh, I've spoken to a lot of people who were at that game. It was one of the ones everybody seemed to be at. And one of the guys who was at it was Charlie Nicholas. So let me tell you my Charlie story. So Charlie Nicholas at that time was an up and coming. He was the, the guy, the golden boy, if you mm-hmm. like. And there was a group of them who were part of Neely Mockin's ground staff. So they were all going to the games. See, this is what's changed. They were all Celtic fans. So we had Charlie Nicholas. We had Jerry Crawley, who's now the president, I think, of Queen's Park. Okay. Uh, Danny Craney, Willie McStay, and a, a guy called Hugh Shanty Ferry from Castle Milk, who was always looked back on fondly by all of his teammates that I've spoken about. I think he was the, the guy in the changing room that kept the, the kind of energy levels oh, up, okay. for want of a better description. But the, the guys all hatched a plan. They were all going to the game. So Charlie probably, uh, or Shanty Ferry, decided that they were going to steal some match-worn jerseys to go to the game, right? So they stole them from Neely Mockin during the day. They were in doing their duties during the day, and they stole said jerseys. And then they've all gone their separate ways. I think Jerry Crawley was with Danny Craney. And anyway, they've come back and they've met at Celtic Park that night, and they've watched the game from the jungle, right? I'd love to see photographs of this. Mm -hmm. Charlie Nicholas, one of the brightest stars of British football within a few months is standing in the jungle with a stolen Celtic <laughs> match worn jersey now what, all their different recollections are, are slightly different as these things always are but Jerry Crawley says it must have been a European jersey because they had the, the white square on the yep. back with the black number so anyway they enjoyed the game and during the game people were saying where'd you get that son because you know replicas weren't as big back then the following day they had to sneak back into Neely's room and hide the jerseys back into one of Neely's uh, hidey holes. They reckon Neely knew about this, but he was quite happy that the boys had done it, and they returned them, so they were, you know, they were quite happy with that. Aye. So that, that's my Charlie Nicholas story. Talk us through the ups and downs of this game then. Oh, where do you begin? Um, obviously, the scene is set. Celtic have to win this game to win the league. Yep. 
Rangers, I believe, still had a game in hand. They did. So it and was, then he did one point. Yeah. So it was basically do or die. Um, Celtic lined up Latchford, McGrain, Lynch, Aitken, McAdam. McAdam, someone I want to talk to you about. Uh, McAdam being a centre forward turned centre back and top goal scorer that season. Mm-hmm. Quite an interesting story. Shuggy Ed Valdison, David Proven, Conroy, McCluskey, McLeod, and Doyle. Vic Davidson on the bench. Vic Davidson was on the bench along with Bobby Lennox. Back in the days where you only had two subs. And I think Tommy Burns was injured, I believe. Could have been. I think Tommy was injured because you see him celebrating at the end of the game with the team and he's got mm. the tie and all that on. But when you look at that, that lineup, what you've got, like we've discussed before, you've got a good mix of experience and youth. Yep. But you've also got some of the, the guys that have come through the ranks. So you're looking at George McCluskey and Roy Aiken. Uh, now, Johnny Doyle will play a part as the part of mine villain in this story. But... Johnny Doyle is so revered by the Celtic support and by all the players that played alongside him. And you hear so many great stories about Johnny. And I understand that his daughter has been working for some time, Joanna, on a book about Johnny Doyle. And I think that'd be a a cracking book. Really good read. Everybody you talk to has got a Johnny Doyle story. Mm -hmm. He had a a black book. He had a wee black book. He he players that had maybe said something on the pitch or kicked him. And, And basically this was his book of revenge, right? So he had he had said some, something had happened. There was a flashpoint when Andy Lynch played with Hearts mm-hmm. and he was up against Johnny and he rated Johnny very highly. But he, he had a bit of red mist about him, Johnny. And something was said. So anyway, Johnny actually told him on the pitch, you're in my black book, Lynch, right? <laughs> so Andy Lynch signs for Celtic, goes into the changing room and who's sitting there but Johnny? I think he was reading in probably the Celtic view. Uh, and... He just says, am I still in your black book, Johnny? And he gets a black book out and scores at his name. <laughs> <laughs> You're all right now, Andy. So there's great stories about Johnny Doyle. And he's one of the guys he was taken too soon. And he's up there. You know, he's, he's got legendary status, Johnny Doyle. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think the thing that connected Johnny Doyle to the Celtic fans was he was just one of us. Mm-hmm. He was just a regular guy who got the chance to live out his dream of playing for Celtic. Every Celtic fan's got that dream of one day pulling on the green and white jersey. You've done it yourself in the charity games where you've been on the Celtic Park pitch. I have. Um, And I'm very jealous of you. I've been on a diet ever since, I must admit. (laughs) But I have have ran on the hollow turf and... A, a bit of footage arrived recently about that. It, it showed oh, it, was like, it was like a, a kind of bit of Pirlo esque, you know, a bit of, and it was me. And how many hours of editing did that take? Quite a bit. <laughs> so I put it up, and Tom Boy went on Twitter, and he was like, "I'm glad you did that because I was about to take you off. It was about five minutes into the game, <laughs> but I did it. I played on that hallowed pitch. It was a brilliant experience. But that's the thing, Johnny Doyle got to live that mm. dream, and not just the once with the Pirlo touch, but for multiple occasions and that seems to connect with the Celtic supporters you take it to the modern day and you would compare Johnny Doyle to say Kieran Tierney um, in yeah. that sense that he was the Celtic boy and playing as if the Celtic jersey was the only jersey there with the, the heart and the soul in every performance and Johnny Doyle done that <laughs> I mean you take a look at the games against Real Madrid um, where Johnny Doyle was the best player on the part that day and he scored against Real Madrid, a Celtic that. supporter. Another goal scorer that night was George McCluskey, who again, massive Celtic fan. Yep. Him and his brother both signed for Celtic. And George tells a great story, actually. Sorry to digress slightly, Colin. He tells a great story about when he signed. And it just shows you the, the team work between Mr. Jockstein and Sean Fallon. Mm-hmm. And they turn up at the door and his father was a massive Celtic fan. So they come to the door. Imagine Jockstein coming to your door as a young laddie, a young Celtic Very fan. Intimidating. And Sean straight away starts working on the mum. So Sean goes into the kitchen and the mum's making a potty soup and Sean's tasting it. Oh, that's a lovely potty soup. And Jock, ta- Jock, who was famously a teetotal, takes out the dad for a pint. So it shows you how they worked together mm-hmm. and that night George signed for Celtic and his brother John signed for Celtic as well great player career cut short through an illness so George McCluskey and Johnny Doyle going against Real Madrid as Celtic fans at Celtic Park is the dream come true oh definitely you know when you look at Johnny as well another thing that's came to my mind nearer the kind of end of his Celtic career he was playing a lot of reserve football yep. right and the corresponding fixture was the first team would play Rangers at Celtic Park and the reserve team would play Rangers at Ibrox. Mm. That's the way it happened back then. So Johnny and the team were travelling to Ibrox to play Rangers reserves. 
and there was a Rangers bus who were also on the same road who were obviously travelling to go and watch the, the big team mm-hmm. playing at Celtic Park and they spotted a couple of the players in the bus so obviously they're giving it the usual and gesticulation so we Johnny brings out the crucifix right which hung on his neck and it's up at the up at the window you know and the fans are going mad you know and then I think they got stuck they got stuck and they were all bearing their arses and everything they, they got stuck in traffic and they were just waiting for them to come out and come for Johnny but that's it he had a, a rap scallion kind of nature that's the kind of thing he did but um, a player who uh, was gone before his time, but as I say, he had a part to play. What was his part on this particular evening? Well, unfortunately for Johnny, there was another name to add to his wee black book, and that was of the referee, Eddie Pringle, who unfortunately sent him off after 51 minutes. Mm. I say unfortunately, having looked back at the footage of this, and his collision with Alec McDonald, he probably deserved it. I mean, nowadays, you wouldn't get away with it. Back then, you might have. Some of the tackles that people got away with were a yellow card, or some of the reactions... You might have got away with it, but unfortunately, when you look at Celtic's uh, history with referees, when Johnny Doyle steps up and does what he does, there's always going to be... What was that, a wee flicky about? Oh, a wee flick. A wee flicky about. And now, McDonald had opened the scoring for Rangers. He had. He was already on the deck when we Johnny uh, reminded him that he was there. So, yeah, and again, it's one of the things, I say pantomime villain, because obviously the outcome of the game, Colin meant that it's gone down in folklore but it didn't cost Celtic the title nope. a few of the players have told me I had a go at Johnny now Johnny was absolutely devastated mm-hmm. in the changing room at, at full time you might have lost us this game so he was he was gutted he was still sitting there with his kit on by all accounts he hadn't gone in for a bath Celtic had won the league and it probably took somebody like Tommy Burns to say to him come on get, in, get involved with the celebrations but a few of them had a go at him so it just shows you you know the emotions run high in a changing room but it's understandable because when you look at some of the players that are in that, that squad, they were Celtic men. Yeah. So to lose the league is bad enough. But to lose the league to a Rangers side would have been unthinkable. So when you look at guys like Roy Aitken, like Danny McGrain, um, like George McCluskey, you can see why they would have had that reaction to Johnny. But would we be looking back on this with such fondness if it wasn't for the fact that we still call it 10 men won the league. I know, it's part of the folklore. And I think at half time, whilst Johnny uh, was still on the pitch, it's 1 nothing to Rangers. Yes. Talk us through the second half. Well, the second half, obviously, a lot, well, we're only a matter of minutes into the game, into the second half, when Johnny gets sent off. As I said, we Eddie Pringle goes into his wee black book. To be fair to Eddie, it wasn't him that directly sent him off. It was the linesman who called him over. But there was a bit of surprise in the air when Johnny gets sent off. Having listened back to some of the players that played that day and what they say, they felt that the sending off just sort of gave them a bit of a boost, weirdly, mm. to fight that bit harder, to dig in, to kind of keep going. And it shows because Celtic equalise on the 66th minute. Roy Aitken scores... There's a belief about the stadium that this is going to be the day, we're going to turn it round. And only a matter of minutes later, George McCluskey makes it 2-1. And at that point, with 15 minutes to go, a lot of the fans that were there were thinking, it's done. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite. As you said, Danny McGrain was unable to make to stop it being two each when he's on the post. A fantastic goal, to be fair to Danny can still hear the sound of the ball hitting the post. Yeah, He says it haunted him. He can still hear it because he could have stopped the ball. It was almost perfect, the goal. The, the angle of the shot from the edge of the box. A corner that was that seemed to be cleared and a bullet of a shot. Fair play to him, two each. Ten minutes to go. Things are getting very nervy, as we said. Rangers only need a point to win that league. They're holding on. A cross comes over and Colin Jackson with the own goal. A save from the goalkeeper. I can't remember who the Rangers goalkeeper was. Palmed out to Jackson's feet. He could do nothing about it. Puts it into his own net. Celtic players were chasing it in to make sure that it did go in. And then, just as the game's coming towards the end, Murdo McLeod, the ball's picked up in the halfway line, played to Murdo about 25 yards out. A whistle of a shot into the top corner. 4 2. The game is over, the league is over, Celtic are the champions. The game is over, I like that. I thought we were moving into takeover territory. <laughs> the game is over. Now, that goal, famously, was voted on the same evening, and it's probably been overshadowed by the fact that Wee Jinky was voted as Celtic's greatest ever player. Mm-hmm. But Celtic's greatest ever team was also voted for that night, and the greatest ever, what was then an old firm goal, 
something we'll not be seeing this season, was voted and it was Murdo McLeod strike. Yep. Now that's incredible because it wasn't televised commercially. No. There was the Celtic Cine Club, I think, had some grainy footage. So the goal does exist and you can search for it on YouTube. But again, going back to Andy, not to sound like I'm repeating myself, but Andy remembers the goal well because he was actually matching Murdo's run mm -hmm. and he was just thinking, do not shoot don't shoot, we're 3-2 up. It was that famous moment, just to have a dig at John Barnes, when Liverpool lost the league to Arsenal. Now, this is before your time. And at that time, Liverpool were in control. It goes up to the top right of the pitch where John Barnes has the ball. All he needs to do is shield it. He loses the ball. And Michael Thomas scored yep. and Arsenal won the league. So it was one of their ones and Andy shouting at uh, Murdo, don't shoot, don't shoot. And we know what happened. So an incredible turnaround, if you think, about where Celtic were at the beginning of the, the campaign. And, you know, after Johnny Doyle got sent off. But as you say, it galvanised them. It seems to be the Celtic way, doesn't it? That we always find the most difficult way to do things. You take it back to Lisbon, we're 1-0 down. Oh, there's been multiple times throughout Celtic's history where all the odds have been against us. And we've still managed to find a way to come through and prevail. But that's in the tapestry of the club though, isn't it? Because the odds were always against Celtic, even being formed back in 1887. So I think there is something special about that. To quote the manager at the time, there's a fairy tale about this club and we do see it and people think, ah, oh, you know, you're over sentimental or you're romanticising about it. But a result like that against all the odds to win the league, you were quite right in saying Rangers still had a game to play. Mm -hmm. It was against Partick Thistle at Ibrox. And you know it's called the ghost game. There was two and a half thousand at Ibrox that night. And that was even with people getting lifted over the barriers? Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. The greatest supporters in the world. I think not. <laughs> so Colin, it's been brilliant to take a walk down memory lane with you. A moment in time in Celtic's history. And we'll do it again uh, week on week from a State of Mind Studios. Thanks everybody for joining us on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. We are streaming live virtually every day. So please subscribe and join us again for a Celtic State of Mind.